Venezuela commemorates the 28th anniversary of the February 4th military rebellion. Kenya's former president, Daniel Arab Moy, dies at age 95. And chaos and uncertainty over the Democratic Iowa caucus results. Hello and welcome to Talisur. I'm Doris Polo in Quito and this is From the South. Venezuela is commemorating the 28th anniversary of the military rebellion against former President Carlos Andres Perez, led by Commander Hugo Chavez on February 4th, 1992. Known as National Dignity Day, the event began with a civic military march led by President Nicolas Maduro at the Plaza Oleri before arriving at the 4F barracks. It's there that those who participated in the rebellion alongside Chavez are being honored. President Maduro said the February 4th rebellion is more alive today than ever as the Bolivarian people remain on alert against the economic war and imperialism. Today we don't have the same conditions as 28 years ago. Back then, the revolution occurred, and Commander Hugo Chavez ordered to stop the privatizations, ordered to stop the repression against our people. Venezuelans finally had their rights recognized, starting from their own identity and their right to read and write. And it hasn't been easy. The commander died, but he left us to continue this task. The 4th of February was a shout for independence, as Diosdado said, of sovereignty, of rebellion, of dignity, of the humble, of the exploited. It was a rebel day. It was a rebellion. Today we can say that it was the first rebellion in the world against the International Monetary Fund, against neoliberalism, against imperialism. That's what distinguishes February 4th from the debauchery that is the coup promoters of the right-wing oligarchy, financed from Colombia, financed by the United States. Here there was dignity, here there was military honor, here the flag of Bolivar was planted. The president, vice president, heads of the Bolivarian National Armed Forces and leaders of the PISOV were joined by the Bolivarian militia and several base organizations, including youth of the United Socialist Party and residents of the 23 de Enero neighborhood, which surrounds the 4F barracks. The candidates representing Bolivia's movement towards socialism party in the upcoming elections, Luis Arce Catacora and David Choquehuanca, have registered their contenders at the Electoral Court. Bolivia's Supreme Electoral Tribunal has confirmed that candidates from eight different parties and alliances registered for the upcoming polls on May 3rd. They have the option to change their nominees up until a few days before the election, according to the head of the TSC, Salvador Romero. The movement towards socialism registered former President Evo Morales as its first candidate for senator in the department of Cochabamba. The movement towards socialism, IPSP, wishes to express our disagreement and report the harassment that our principal delegate to the Supreme Electoral Tribunal is receiving. This is yet another trick of this de facto government that does not want us to participate in the elections. They do not want us to participate in the elections. They will continue their hostile attitude to the mass IPSP, or leaders of social movements, former government officials, and we regret that. We have the people by our side. We are the only party, the only political opinion which represents the interests of the humblest of people, from our indigenous brothers, from our peasant brothers, from the impoverished middle classes, increasingly impoverished by this government. Mass IPSP, with people organized, people united, will participate in these elections. Our correspondent, Freddy Morales, has more from La Paz. We are here outside the Supreme Electoral Court in La Paz, where a few minutes ago, the president of the court, Salvador Romero, confirmed that eight slates for president and vice president from eight different political groupings have been nominated and their papers have been delivered. Their names are up on the Electoral Court's website. So, so far, there are these eight candidates for president with their respective running mates. There are also 130 candidates for the lower house and 36 for the senate for each of these political parties and groupings. 
The president of the court explained that they have six days to study these nominations and verify them against the papers that have been handed in. If there are any discrepancies or papers missing, the candidates will still have a chance to be able to present the missing papers. If they don't, that space will become vacant and the political party will be able to fill it with other names. This also applies to the candidates for president and vice president. This means that until the day before the election on the 3rd of May, these eight political parties and fronts could change their lists of candidates. The president of the court said that everything is proceeding normally. What he did not want to comment on was the political persecution against members, leaders and candidates of the movement towards socialism. We should remember that the presidential candidate of the MAS, Luis Arce, is facing legal proceedings and is due to appear before a judge in the coming days. This happened just after he was chosen as the mass candidate. In fact, he was included in a case that was opened four years ago relating to alleged corruption. But throughout those four years, while he was serving as a minister, he was never named in the case, only when he was chosen as the mass candidate for these elections. So the judge will decide whether he can face the accusations in freedom or whether he will be imprisoned like other leaders, supposedly to prevent them from fleeing. That was our correspondent, Freddy Morales, with that report. Moving to the Caribbean. Considering its long and successful history in the petroleum industry, Trinidad and Tobago is positioning itself as an aid to other Caribbean countries who've recently had fines in the sector. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley made the announcement at the country's 2020 Energy Conference, which began on Monday. Trinidad and Tobago, with its long history in the industry, is well poised to assist the new entrants, Guyana, Grenada, Barbados, Jamaica, and the Bahamas, in the development of their petroleum sectors. To date, we have entered into memoranda of cooperation with Guyana, Grenada, and Barbados for provision of technical assistance. Preliminary discussions are in the early stages on the development of unitization agreements with Grenada and Barbados for the exploration of hydrocarbon reservoirs that extend beyond our respective maritime borders. Also speaking at the event was Barbados Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley, who lamented the failure of the revised Treaty of Chagaramas, which established the CARICOM single market and economy, to address energy issues, including high production costs. Electricity prices and energy prices in the Caribbean have been prohibitive, particularly for those of us who are trying to craft out a way for development for our people. And when you look at the fact that you are meandering between 20 US cents and 37 US cents to be able to produce electricity, no wonder the IMF has declared that this region is one of the regions that has had their competitiveness completely eroded by the cost of energy. Meanwhile, questions are being raised as to whether Guyana, the world's newest major oil producer, made a bad deal with the U.S. oil giant ExxonMobil. The natural resource watchdog Global Witness says Guyana lost as much as $55 billion in revenue due to a poorly negotiated deal with the company. It said the South American country settled for 52% of the revenue from the massive offshore Starbrook block, while national governments usually receive 65 to 85%. ExxonMobil responded by saying the report was misleading as it failed to account for the risks it assumed in exploring the unproven deep water area. Trinidad and Tobago has enacted legislation that permits information on sexual offenders to be shown on an online website. The Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs issued a statement which said the Sexual Offenses Amendment Act 2019 took effect at the end of January. The law allows for the public to access convicted perpetrators' names, addresses, photographs, and offenses committed. The Commissioner of Police can also publicize this information. In addition, the law allows for victims to seek compensation from their attackers. We'll take a short break now and when we come back, a look at how Cuba continues to resist against the U.S. economic blockade. Don't go anywhere.
Who's moving the chess man? What interests and motivate the actors behind each event? The board is deployed. Critical move. Investigates every event from Monday to Friday. Only on the Zoom. President Daniel Arab Moy has died aged 95, according to an announcement from the current head of state, Uhuru Kenyatta, on Tuesday morning. There was no immediate word on the cause of death, but Moy had reportedly been in and out of the hospital in recent months with breathing difficulties. A former school teacher, he ruled Kenya between 1978 and 2002, making him the country's longest serving president. Moy leaves behind a mixed legacy. Despite being labeled a corrupt dictator by his critics, he remained very popular among his supporters. Despite his, his, his shortcomings as human being, there was a good security system in Kenya that uh, the information you would get, get and react immediately if there is a threat outside or inside the republic against the security the, the, the security of Kenya. So Moi died and it's a happy day in our country because Moi was a murderer, Moi was a bad man, Moi raped this country, Moi destroyed our past and even is destroying our future. The president we have today is actually a product of Moi, who's a Moi political orphan. So there's no mourning in this country. The only people who are mourning are Moi political orphans. But for the most of Kenyans actually, it's a relief. This man lived so long with all his evilness. It's actually a surprise why bad people live so long. Uh, during my days, people disappeared, there was detention without trial, people were tortured, people were killed. There's nothing good to say about Moi. Lesotho's fugitive first lady, Mai Sai Tabin, has handed herself over to police after weeks of being on the run. She arrived back in the country on Tuesday from South Africa and headed to police headquarters to answer questions relating to investigations into the murder of Prime Minister Tom Tabin's estranged Lipole Lipolelo. She fled Lesotho on January 10th after police had summoned her for questioning for the murder of Lipolelo, who was gunned down in 2017. A South African judge has issued an arrest warrant for former President Jacob Zuma over his failure to attend his corruption trial. State prosecutors asked the judge to issue the warrant after Zuma's legal team applied for him to be absent from court, citing ill health. Zuma's lawyer presented the court with a sick note from what he said was a military hospital. But the judge questioned whether the note was valid as there was no medical number showing if and where the doctor was certified. The warrant, however, does not come into effect until the case resumes on May 6th. In this instance, um, counsel for Mr. Zuma was notified in advance in the middle of January that this document or that sound evidence is required to justify his absence from court. And without that evidence, this court cannot do anything else but issue a warrant of arrest. Shifting gears now, in the last few years, the United States government has tightened its blockade against Cuba. Yet, production has continued unabated at joint venture companies with foreign capital. Our correspondent went to one of the island's main distilleries to see how. This is Cuba's house of age rum at the San Jose distillery. The land here and the climate are perfect for producing rum. The San Jose Distillery was built to the highest environmental standards. This 150-year-old tree is witness to that. The plants were altered to avoid cutting it down. 
estamos en una zona donde hay un... Below the ground here we have an important water source, which plants an important part in the blending of the rum. So we have to respect very strict environmental standards in order to take care of both what is below ground and above it. Here the rum is distilled from cane molasses in a continuous 24-hour process. And it is aged in these barrels of white oak. The technology is modern but the master distillers use this traditional technique to test the quality. This is a test using the sense of touch in our hands and the aroma to check the quality of the rum as it ages. We use it at the hand of the process of producing Havana Club rum, and it is the same technique our ancestors used. Rum is a part of the Cuban identity, linked to legends and oral traditions, and essential to carnival celebrations and other community and family rituals. That is why in 2016, Cuba declared the knowledge of its master distillers a part of the national heritage. The aging is a continuous process that produces changes naturally and creates the particular characteristics of a rum. Very delicate, soft, but strong. This very well-balanced aging that makes for a really pleasing, mature rum. In fact, we often say that the rum is like the Cuban people. It even has the same joy and happiness. In spite of the tightening of the United States blockade against Cuba, in 2019 the San Jose distillery produced 4.7 million 9-liter cases of rum, a result seen as very satisfactory. We occupy the 23rd position in an international ranking of all spirits. This is particularly remarkable, given that we are excluded from the North American market, which accounts for about 40% of what will be our natural market, and so given that we are denied that 40%. These results are especially pleasing. Experts say that the San Jose distillery is a perfect combination of technology and tradition. This master distiller and chemical engineer has been ensuring that quality for 31 years. He says they do not regulate the temperature or humidity, and there is zero use of artificial substances. For him, the secret of the quality is simple. It is that the distillery is in Cuba. This week, government ministers, CEOs of mining companies and investors are meeting in Cape Town, South Africa for the 26th Investing in African Mining in Daba, the world's largest mining investment conference. The theme of the Indaba is optimizing growth and investment in the digitized mining economy. Top of the agenda seems to be attracting global investors to coal-driven mining projects, despite trends of investors to support greener sectors. South Africa's Mineral Resources and Energy Minister Gwedi Mantashe gave the opening address at the Indaba. Afterwards, he spoke to journalists and fielded questions about South Africa's energy problems. He announced that it is time for a new entity to provide electricity and reduce the nation's reliance on the state utility ESCOM for its energy. He also warned that the transition from coal to renewable energy sources would not be a hasty process. Uh, we're managing a, 16, a fleet of 15 coal power generated power stations. Uh, if we take an attitude of destroy coal power generation immediately, will be taking a dangerous route because we are dependent on coal generated at this point in time and therefore transition must be managed responsibly and carefully. The five-day event expects to host more than 6,000 participants which include presidents, cabinet ministers and at least 900 global investors. Johan Abrams for Telesur in Cape Town.
We'll be taking one last break, after which we look at the preliminary predictions of the Democratic Party's Iowa caucus. Stay with us. The Pakistani journalist Tariq Ali examines the mass media influence promoted by imperialism. Get access to the analysis of the socio-economic and political life of the whole South America on our screen and platform in English. A critical place committed to the truth to determine the major events that transform the world today. Mondays, only on Telesur. With a communique addressed to Colombia's prosecutor sectors of the opposition to the government of Ivan Duque, requested the creation of a commission to travel to Venezuela to hear statements by the former Colombian senator Ida Melano regarding vote buying throughout the Atlantic coast. With this formal request, Colombian prosecutors could receive the statements of former Senator Ida Merlano, who was recently captured in Maracaibo, Venezuela. She was directly involved in that electoral traffic for years, so there is a lot of fear in certain political sectors in Colombia about the possibility, not only if she speaks, but as she has said, if she also provides evidence in Colombia. Merlano was sentenced to 15 years of prison for the crimes of electoral corruption, corruption which allowed her to be elected as a senator of the Republic for the Conservative Party, which conformed the political case of the Atlantic Department, such as the Char and Garland families. We want to not only uncover what is occurring on the Atlantic, which is a domain for these types of practices. The Atlantic is nearly a very important prototype for explaining what's happening in the country electorally. Sectors of the opposition hope that the new attorney general will act independently and make the transfer of the prosecutor's commission possible, with the objective of allowing the country to know firsthand the hidden truth about the network of corruption and the political mafias in Colombia through the information which the former lawmaker may disclose. What we are doing is transmitting a right of petition. He expressed it at the time that he was appointed by the Supreme Court, saying that he is willing to give a hard fight against corruption. We see in this case of Aida Melano a huge possibility that he fulfills his word and appoints a commission of prosecutors that will be transferred to Venezuela to receive her statements. Every country knows she has very important information regarding the scenario of electoral corruption on the coast. The lawmakers who've solicited the commission await an answer from the Attorney General Francisco Barbosa within the next 10 days. Otherwise, a congressional commission will head to Venezuela to interview Merlano themselves, all following President Nicolas Maduro's invitation to collaborate with Colombian authorities on this case. The results of the Democratic Party's Iowa caucus, the first voting process in the lead up to the 2020 presidential election in the United States, have been delayed due to vast irregularities. The Democratic Party said it was simply a reporting issue and that there was no hack or intrusion with the system used to tally results. The Iowa State Party said it was doing quality checks on the results and found inconsistencies in the reporting of the data. While the results are still unclear, several candidates gave what appear to be victory speeches. According to previous polls, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders holds the lead. Thank you. Let me, let me begin by stating that I imagine, have a strong feeling that at some point the results will be announced. 
And when those results are announced, I have a good feeling we're going to be doing very, very well here in Iowa. And now it is on to New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina, California, and onward to victory. Thank you all very much.